Hello, and welcome to another recording in our series on Iowa vegetable production and management. My name is Donald Lewis, professor of entomology at Iowa State University, and today we're going to talk about another familiar insect, the Colorado potato beetle. Colorado potato beetle has a long history in the United States and in Iowa, and a well-known pest throughout the area. Colorado potato beetle uh, is named for the state of Colorado, but as you'll see in a minute, that may not be totally accurate. But let's first learn how to identify it. It's familiar to a lot of people. It is, it's oval, it's nine to 14 millimeters long, which means approximately a half an inch in body length, but very convex, almost as tall as it is wide in the adult stage. It's yellow to brown with those 10 black stripes, and those stripes are what give it its name, Leptina tarsa desalineata. The species name says 10 lines. So it tells you right away that that's a prominent feature of this beetle, and that's how it got its name. So those black stripes on the wing covers and the fact that it's on your potato crop is a good indication of how you would recognize it. The immature stage is a larva, because like all beetles, the Colorado potato beetle has a complete life cycle of four stages, egg, larva, pupa, and adult. And these vary from reddish orange to almost brick red, and very definitely humpbacked. Now they do have a little black head and they have those six jointed legs up near the, the, the head of the body and the black spots along the side, that's about it. But when you see them ravenously feeding on your potato foliage, tomatoes and some other crops, it's not that hard to figure out who this is. One of the confusing things is the size. They start out very tiny they can be oh, less than 3 16ths of an inch long when they first emerge from the egg. And then when they're full grown, they'll be up to 10 millimeters, which again, uh, we're talking over a quarter of an inch, about 3 eighths of an inch in size. So they vary greatly as they're growing. And that's one of the things that sort of confuses the identification. But the damage they do is very uh, well understood that once those eggs are laid on the undersides of the leaves, usually in a cluster, there'll be a whole bunch of eggs laid together. Those larvae that vary from red to pale orange begin to feed on the foliage and can be quite destructive. After a few weeks of feeding, those larvae drop to the ground and burrow in just a little distance where they form a pupa. The pupa then transforms to the adult stage and they come out to begin the cycle over. The life cycle of the Colorado potato beetle is that they start the winter, uh, they start the season as adults. They have spent the winter in the soil, in the, under the thatch, under the loose leaf, under the uh, leaf debris, under the loose bark of dead trees. They've been hiding in a, a sheltered location through the winter, and when they come out of hibernation in the springtime, they're hungry. So by May, we usually see them. And no matter where they emerged, they are going to find the potato field and begin feeding there. They may not travel really long distances to find your potato crop, but if the potatoes are near where they're hibernating, as soon as the potatoes sprout and begin to come up out of the ground, they could be at risk. The larvae, again, feed for only a couple to three weeks. And during that time, they're going to grow that tremendous amount that we already talked about. They uh, pupate in the soil, takes that stage about two to three weeks to complete the transformation from larva to beetle. And then those beetles come out and repeat the cycle for at least two full generations per year. Now in really hot summers and early springs followed by a late fall, we can get a partial third generation. But there are at least two generations and it's really that second generation that occurs in the second half of the summer is when we notice the most severe damage. So egg, larva, pupa, and adult, and uh, the life cycle tells you what you need to know about timing and uh, looking for damage and so forth. Colorado potato beetle has an interesting history in that it was originally an insect in Mexico but it was first collected in the United States in 1811 in the Missouri River Valley, allegedly by Lewis and Clark as they were making their way up the Missouri River. But it wasn't named until many years later. 
13 years later in 1824, it actually got its name of Leptinitarsa desalineata. At the time of its discovery, the Colorado potato beetle was the buffalo burr beetle. That is a weed that grows in western Iowa and the Great Plains. And the Colorado potato beetle was on that member of the potato family. For four decades, nobody thought anything about it. Here's a beetle that eats a weed. Why would we care? Why would we worry about that? But 40, 40, 40 years later, in the 1860s and so forth, the European settlers came to the Great Plains and came to Iowa. And with them, they brought the potato. Potato is not a native crop to Iowa. The Colorado potato beetle is a native insect in North America, but the potato had to come out here. And in 1859, near Omaha, Nebraska, a settler's potato crop was damaged by what we now call the Colorado potato beetle. So there's kind of this interesting history is the beetle was here and we brought the crop to it. The beetle was here not causing any problems, but we brought in a new food source that the beetle loved even more than the weed that it was eating. It got its name sometime later. Remember it was found in 1811, but it wasn't until 1867 that a famous entomologist named C.V. Riley was looking at it and gave it the name Colorado potato beetle possibly because of a connection to this Missouri River, and maybe it had been found in Colorado. We don't know the real story of that one, but um, it was a, uh, an interesting history that we don't normally talk about. Normally we bring the pest to the crop, and this time we brought the crop to the pest. Well, from then, the Colorado potato beetle just followed potato fields all the way back to the East Coast and reached the Atlantic Ocean in 1874. That's a pretty fast trip if you think about a, a beetle having only a couple times per year when it can get up and fly and go from one field to the next, and yet it got across the United States all the way to the Atlantic Ocean in that short amount of time. Well, what are we going to do about the Colorado potato beetle as far as management goes? The plants can tolerate a certain amount of damage. Minor damage is not a problem. The plants will still yield. You'll still get marketable potatoes because the damage occurs to the foliage and to the stems above ground. We have not found resistant varieties. We have not found reliable biological controls that will reduce the population. Crop rotation comes up as a possibility. And some places recommend that you put the potato field a quarter of a mile or a mile away from where it was last year on the assumption that you can fool the beetle and it won't be able to find the potatoes where you hide them the following year. I think there's some validity to that, but I wouldn't bet the whole ranch on being able to fool Colorado potato beetles and believe they're not going to find the crop. Trap crop is a possibility. If the beetles are on one plant that's more desirable than the others, you could treat them there and try to protect the other, uh, the main crop. And this is also just listed as a possibility and probably not a very strong one. Then under insecticides, we have several choices. And these are mentioned in our Midwest Vegetable Production Guide. Some of them are systemics that you put on the soil or you put on the foliage that go into the plant. The ones that you put on the soil are taken up by the roots, go up through the plant, come out in the leaves, and will feed the color, will um, kill the Colorado potato beetle larvae as they are feeding on the foliage. We can also do the same thing with chemical insecticides that we apply to the foliage of the plant. What we're trying to do is stop the beetle larvae from feeding. We're trying to protect that foliage. We want to keep that foliage on the plant. And so we control them that way. We also have some biological insecticides. These are living organisms that you put out in the field as a, uh, you, you apply them as a pesticide on the hopes of controlling the Colorado potato beetle. Now I mentioned that defoliation could be tolerated and our Midwest Vegetable Production Guide for the last several years, you should make sure you get the most recent edition and not necessarily an old one like I'm showing here, shows that 20 to 30% of the foliage could be eaten in the pre-flowering stage and you would not experience reduced yield. Now, 
as we get into flowering, the plant becomes much more susceptible to defoliation, and that threshold drops by quite a bit to five to five to ten percent, and then jumps back up into the tuber formation to thirty percent. So if there's a few Colorado potato beetles and a light amount of damage, you don't need to rush out and control. The plant will tolerate the difference. Here's what I said about crop rotation. Move the fields as far as possible away from the previous location. And that's usually considered to be a quarter of a mile. Adults don't have a very good sense of which way to go to find the next potatoes. And they may get to your new field, but it will be later than if you had planted the potatoes right back into the same area. Okay. And then the other things we talked about, trap cropping and systemics are there. Flaming is not generally done for insect control. You'd have to be awfully careful with your flamethrower to kill beetle larvae and not damage the plant. In fact, it's such a fine line, I'm not even going to uh, suggest that you do that. But Others have tried that. Vacuum and suction methods and hand picking will work in the garden. I can be out in my little potato patch in my backyard and keep ahead of the Colorado potato beetles by picking them off by hand. That's not going to work in a big field, is it? Okay. That trap crop could be to plant early potatoes. That would be the first thing the potato beetles would find, and you would put that between last year's crop and this year's crop, hoping they stop and eat there. Then where those beetle larvae are feeding, where those beetles have stopped to reproduce for the first generation, you could control them with insecticide or spraying or flaming or some other control, um, but that's going to be a lot of extra effort to protect the crop. But just remember trap cropping is one of those things that we think might work. We can't strongly recommend them because of the uncertainty that the beetles are going to stop in the crop, but we do it this time by planting very early ahead of the main crop. Now, of course, if you're planting early to get to the farmer's market early with potatoes, this really isn't an option for you either. Under insecticides, we have systemic biological and foliar insecticides, and we need to be scouting, checking for the presence of beetle larvae, checking for the amount of uh, damage, so that we do the best job of using the insecticide in its most effective way. So don't spray before the larvae are there. Don't spray after the damage is already done. We need to find those small larvae that are beginning to feed in large numbers to prove the necessity of for using a, an insecticide. Eggs are not susceptible to insecticides. The adults are probably not terribly uh, affected by insecticide sprays either. So what we're hoping to do is sort of find mid-size larvae. Little tiny ones, the mid-size ones, are going to be the easiest ones to control. But because the beetles appear over a period of time and they don't all arrive at once, you'll find all sizes and stages of the beetle at the same time. So you have to do a lot of good scouting, a lot of uh, good monitoring to find the larvae when they're going to be vulnerable to an applied foliar insecticide. Now, we don't get a lot of damage in the first generation, but there's some indication that if you controlled the first, genera first generation, it would protect your crop from the second generation that's going to come later in the year. Often we just don't notice Colorado potato beetles until July or August. And by then we're into production, we're into harvest, we're uh, really busy and it's going to be tough to get a good control at that time. So this is one to look for early and to start uh, treatments early. There are some reduced risk insecticides. These might fit into your um, organic treatment um, program. The uh, spinosad is a, sold as in trust is an uh, interesting one. You're not applying a bacteria, you're applying a bacterial fermentation product. So this is something that came from a bacteria, but it's not the bacterium itself. Ramon is an insect growth regulator, which means it must be sprayed on small larvae to be effective. It will not control the large larvae, it will only control the very small early instars. Bacillus thuringiensis tenebrionis is a strain of the bacterium Bt 
that is specific to beetles. Just like BTK is specific to caterpillars, BTI is specific to mosquito larvae, BTT is specific to beetle larvae, and a product that uh, might fit into your scheme. The Colorado potato beetle has a huge write-up in the most recent Midwest Vegetable Production Guide for Commercial Growers. I encourage you to get a, a copy of that from your local state extension and uh, state uh, extension system. It covers all of these states here in the Midwest, on out to the Great Plains, um, where the specialists get together. We consider all the available options and put our best uh, information into this guide. And there'll be a long list of insecticides and some very detailed instructions for when and how to use them in this uh, vegetable guide. Just make sure you're getting the one for the right year. So we've talked about the life cycle of Colorado potato beetle. We've talked about two generations per year. We've talked about some alternative controls that may be um, practical and applicable to your situation. We've also talked about the ability to tolerate damage and put up with the defoliation rather than try to try to treat the, the beetles. And we also know we have lots of controls available. So thank you for your time and attention. We'll see you on the next one.